I mean, you can even tell the vibe and energy is just different over here. I don't know if you can sense that, but you can, yeah, you can feel it. Yeah, so FYI, when we get to this uh, this address, mm -hmm. let's make it quick. We ain't trying to really be on the spotlight in that hood for too long, so. I ain't gonna be one of those motherfuckers in front like, yeah, I go back to my community and all that other shit, nah. <laughs> I have no, no connect, you know what I'm saying? No connection, you know? Like, even the people that I did grow up with, that I'm still in contact with, they even moved out. So you all these nice homes, abandoned and boarded up. All right, I think we're getting close. One more block up. This is the lot right here where I used to live. Because I told you the house burned down. So this is the property right here. What I remember was I was taking a nap, and all I heard was somebody screaming. It was that the place is on fire, and an uh, adoptive mom's son picked me up and carried me out the house. They were literally going to the house trying to pull out furniture while the house is on fire to save whatever they could. Yeah, it was like crazy. I, it's like a weird feeling to be back here as a grown ass man. It's like it never existed. Even though I have a memory of it, it's not here. And if you go to the hospital I was born in, it's not there anymore. If you go to the grammar school I went to, it doesn't exist anymore. It's almost like my past has been slowly like dissolved. My personality is very aloof, so I try not to absorb so much stuff in my surroundings. I guess it's like a self-defense mechanism. It's hard to get to know. If you meet him once or twice or even a few times, you probably don't know who he is. You know, he doesn't let anyone in, you know, immediately. You know, and he's close guard, and that's a part of, you know, his upbringing, part of him growing up. I can't get into the legalities of it when my mom had a certain situation and lifestyle that kept her moving around from place to place. Because of the situation, she had to leave me basically with adoptive parents. I wasn't great at socialization. I actually became like the black sheep or like the kid to pick with or to mess with or beat up on. Like if you grew up with people, they used to come to your house for your birthday and sleep over or come to backyard barbecues. And then when you get a certain age, you're walking down the street, they're grabbing you by the neck, putting your chip, choke hold, taking your money, or like, you know what I'm saying, stuff off of you, or sticking a gun in your side and said, oh, you know me, and I know you. I know how your family got a little loot. So don't even tr start off saying you ain't got nothing, and you gotta give it up. So that, yeah, that messes with you, you know? Things start to get very negative, you know? And it was kind of like when I would go to my parents tell them that, they were just like, you're just gonna have to figure it out for yourself. You know, and that let me know I was really alone after that. And I actually had a realization that I had to like do the best I can in school, graduate as early as I could, and just get away. And I was just like, I finished high school at 16. Like that summer, I was done. I purposely like rebelled, pissed off my doctor's parents. I would just go out and party. I would just leave the house and I just didn't give a damn. And I really remember coming from a party at the Hummingbird. It was a weeknight. When I came back, all my stuff was in a black garbage bag and they just like, we're done. And it really hurt because my big papa didn't even look at me. And that was it. Negativity is a heavy burden, a weight. I just had to let go, so. And then when I went out and about on my own, you know, at 16, I floated wherever. Either my brother's house, friend's house, the friends who I met at parties or whatever would let me crash at their place or sleep in the basement. I became what you call urban refugee. One way for me to survive was go to clubs on certain nights just because it was in the wintertime because it was warmth, you know what I'm saying? You could be indoors and have like some heat, you know what I'm saying, until like four in the morning. So this used to be the entrance uh, what used to be Medusa's back in the day. This is the spot that opened my eyes up fully. And it was like a Petri dish of a cultural experiment all across the board with fashion, ethnicities, cultures, music. And I ran to a lot of people that's Asian, Caucasian, Hispanic, I learned from. Because where I grew up at, if, if, if they wasn't of your skin complexion or culture, then they was the enemy. Medusa's 
It's like a one big large room and you got your certain groups. Pretty much people had the same kind of style as far as the, the vest and the baggy shirt and the, and, the, and the MC Hammer type pants bagginess and the pad leather shoes because the pad leather shoes allows you to slide on the floor and do your moves real good. You're spinning, you're twisting and all that. I just knew it was a bunch of people having a good time dancing, you know, under one roof to great music. You know, that's the one thing about house music culture in Chicago. If you grew up on the west side or the south side of Chicago, if you got, experience, you got exposed to music and different cultures of music, you know, then it made you want to reach out for more and not be stuck on the block where you at. You want to go out there and learn more about life and people in general. You know, I met other kids who was in my same, you know, situation and we would like band together and find safe havens for we go all the way up north. I used to have an old beat up sleeping bag. Me and a couple of friends of mine would go lay out over there behind the building and, and crash because sometimes Evanston police would come and circulate. But like if we figured there's days that, you know, some cops wouldn't give a damn, we'll just be right out, laid out towards the edge and just sleep. Chose these places because I figured it was safer. I'm like, what place better to be homeless but in a neighborhood that's considered with no crime? I could have been homeless hanging out in Inglewood in the back alley somewhere in an abandoned house, but chances are I could have got fucked up. So I felt it was better for me to like be in environments where I had to learn how, say, the other half live to be able to be assimilate. Because eventually I knew I was gonna go to university and I couldn't come from that mentality where I grew up where people were killing, robbing, pimping, selling drugs or whatever. And a part of anything about this whole documentary is to let people know, if I came from that environment to be able to go to other places in the world, like Australia, Japan, France, wherever, they can do it too. They just gotta like, find places to keep their mind right. So this place, I come here because it's the Baha'i faith, and it encompasses all world religions under one roof. Yeah, so I've been coming to this place since like 1990. Like when I used to be homeless on the street or whatever, if I wasn't at the beach, I would come over here and like nod off in the corner. And then like in the winter time, they got huge vents and I would lay on top of the vents. So this is a place that's always gonna be with me that helped me spiritually grow as a person to be a better being. That's how I feel about this place. If anything, this will be like my spiritual, um, this will be my spiritual mother, father, my end all be all. Like no matter what happens to me in life, I can come here and I can just get some calm. When you're trying to survive, there is no low point. You just gotta just keep moving. You gotta keep moving forward to the next, to the next, to the next. He never had a victim mentality like what was, you would never, ever see Jamal like on a street corner or something asking for money. It, just, it would never occur to him in a thousand years. I didn't really notice that he was actually homeless until I started going to the parties and then realized that, you know, in actuality he was homeless and he was going, you know, late at night after the parties were done. He was hooking up with, you know, various girls, whatever, partly for a place to stay. I had to do what I had to do. And in the process, you know, I did some things that people might feel morally, you know, not digestively. I hate to say it, I would go to clubs to find, you know, women who were looking for some comfort. So, you know, in the process, I ran to another dude who was a professional at it. You know, it was kind of weird. He was much older, so he kind of took me under his wing and like taught me the game. I gotta thank him. It's weird to thank somebody who could train you to be a gigolo to women, but I survived. Right here was a pinnacle point in my life. It's the reactor, 1115 West Lake. So all this was basically warehouse district for meat packing. People would come here because it was already kind of like off the grid. You have to worry about noise complaints because it was undesirable area to be into in the first place. Oh man, so we had to take certain routes. And boy, we was on security coming home. We had one person watching the front and then one person watching the map because see, you know, we, 
we not only had to watch out for the gangbangers going back home, we had to watch out for certain sounds scratching on the ground. You hear a little chain jingling. Let me hit where the keys at. I gotta make a little example where the keys at. Or well, you hear that jingling, that's the jingling from the chain on his neck. You gotta watch out for the dogs, the loose dogs, big old dogs too. So we had obstacles. You know, that was like, uh, it was rave time in Chicago. We were pretty social. We pursued women together. <laughs> we'll, we'll move around, see who's getting down, you know, and we found out a little spot that we could dance at, you know? And it, it just seemed like when we started dancing, you know, it's just females. Just start just flowing. Jamal doing his his, his deep house, got his knees on his on the ground, and he's just doing his deep house dance, jacking it up on his knees. And so my memories are like from looking afar, knowing that these particular guys, you could tell when they move, like their head was somewhere. They were thinking about something. He used to dance a lot. Yeah, you can see I don't really do it too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's different. I know, it's different now, but you, you never gain weight when you dance in eight straight hours. Getting That's sanctified, true. you know That's what I'm saying? True. Yeah. My high was just getting off on the floor and then watching beautiful people do their thing. And for me, beautiful people was lovely women being fluid, moving about. It wasn't about getting up and humping the ass or whatever. It was just watching them feel free and just do their thing. It wasn't about being cute or beautiful or um, hedonistic. Yeah. It was a different aggression in being joyful. People actually moved like it was a Broadway musical. People were, or like it was a ballet. Everybody moved, nobody was ashamed to be free. Clearly, some people were taking it to a different level. They were having an artistic exploration through movement. But there are so many different aspects of dance. Some people were there being social dancers in the position to lead, follow, submit, or aggress. And others were really like shaping this movement that went with this soundscape. Upstairs, it used to be Ron Trent and then DJ Rush. So you gotta imagine that type of energy with those type of jocks, with the selection, you know what I'm saying? Like, just like feverish. Ron Trent and Rush brung it. And I am not far between to get on my knees and say, thank you, I appreciate what you did. It made me who I am today. So right now we headed to Gramophone, which is about two blocks up the street. And that's where all the locals who's in the industry come to buy their music. It's a staple. Like if you really want to get your culture on and do your digging, you come in here and start searching. It's Gramophone Records, Chicago. Jamal's been coming in for a long time. Um, always a regular and... Yeah, yeah. The one thing I had beef with my gramophone was back in the day, all the DJs would work here and they would get all the hot test pressings. You would come in and try to get the hottest record and they already scooped them up, two or three copies. You'd be like, have to wait for the actual official release to come out. And then for like two months, they just bang yeah, the hotness. double packs with all the extra mixes on Exactly, they bang all the hotness and you'd be sitting there like, this is bull. It was tough back then. Yeah. I mean, we literally would walk out the back door of the store <laughs> with a stack of records yay high in our hands and people would be standing at the door just grabbing, taking before they even went to the walls to get all the hot stuff that came through. You know how like you go to the grocery store and they say it's best to buy all food on Tuesdays, that's when it's like fresh in? It was kind of like that at Gramophone. Uh -huh. So you come here on a Tuesday and you go to Foxy's that night yeah, and yeah. get to hear it beat by Spencer and Derek and for sure. Yeah. 
And didn't Derek Carr used to be a buyer? That's like yes. I was able to get some of the hot stuff in here. Derek, yes. yeah. Andy Moy was the first. Yeah. And Josh Warner. Mark Farina, Ralphie Rosario worked at Gramophone. Chicago's always kind of been known for a place that you, it's where you put your dues in. They don't give you any breaks and they make you work your, work your butt off. And that's, I think, why a lot of guys who come from here have done so well. Well, yeah, imagine going to a party and you got to play records and you got like Spencer Kinsey, Dez, Derek Carter, Mark Farina just looking at you while they're having some drinks. That, if that don't fuck you up. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll make you sweat a little bit. Yeah, sweat a little bit, yeah. I, I basically, you know, from being a dancer and kicking it and going out to the parties and stuff, I gravitated towards people who I thought was pinnacle and cultivating the Chicago scene behind the scenes. So Derek Carter, go Mike Dunn, with Justin Long, Terry Mullen. Justin Long is probably one of the longest resident DJs in Chicago. Bad Boy Bill, he's pretty big now. There's Frankie Knuckles right over there. Because I always figure it's always that person that's behind someone or get them in the industry. And I found out it was Steve Poindexter. So I ended up connecting with him and learning from him. And then the same thing happened with Adonis when I was at university. And, you know, he became, you know, a mentor. But he was the main one that was just like, okay, you got to know rhythms. Fuck all the chords. Fuck all this fancy equipment, whatever. You just got to know the basics. And then he gave me a drum machine, and he was just like, you take this big bulky thing, and you do every combination of rhythm, syncopation, you know what I'm saying, measure, tempo, and you can figure every possible way to do that, and then I'll graduate you to the next level of other stuff. Yeah, every time I saw Jamal, he had a drum machine, and he was always working on beats. He always had headphones and a drum machine, and every time I would see him, he was like, he listened to this. But remember, that you had a house in Evanston? Yeah, when I was in school, I had that house right. on Foster, yeah. And I just remember looking at this weird little green screen, you were making tracks. Yeah, on a drum the, machine, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. the equipment is not what it is now. It was like, you were making music out of weird squeaky squawks, and next thing you know, it's something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But when I would hear his music, it was abstract, it was scientific. It had not just a story, not just a narrative or a, um, some kind of, you know, feeling to it. It would make you think and feel in different ways. I don't think he's like conforming to any of the kind of normal electronic music genres or ideas. It comes through, I think, a lot of times through really unconventional arrangements and like uh, choices, like textures. There's kind of a mystery to his music. There's kind of a sense like, who is this guy? Where is this taking me? Once it gets into it, then you can say, oh, okay, it's really expression of him. It's therapeutic. This is like my form of like stress release. The equipment that I have, the keyboards, the sense, the drum machines, that is my counselor. That is my prescription, you know what I'm saying? My medication. And with this music, it helps me get through whatever moment it is. My experimental interpretation sonically. This is a John Heckle piece off my label, so. You can be with me. All right. I let you take me places with music, right? Yeah. Well, I can put you on the shoulder and do the whole. That's an old one. You think they ready for that one? Are you? How is that? You laying across? He is and will always be a mover as well as a musician because in our paradigm they are not separate that's at the root of who he is is how he would move to a sound oh oh shit you got it all right i'm old so i would sum my life up to uh, like a divine intervention like something powerful in the universe has been guiding me when I thought there was like no way out, there was always some door that opened up. Even though it didn't work out with my family, biological or adoptive, the club is the family. That loft scene is my family. My best friends who you interview is my family. Gramophone records is my family. You know, those club spots you went to, I showed you to is my family. The music I'm into is my family. All my experiences who made me who I am to this day are from here. And I said the one thing I won't give up on is Chicago. 
I will stay here and try to contribute to the culture as best I can.